Our constant search for knowledge has led us through many paths and brought us to many places. There are an infinite number of answers out there with even more questions to ask. With this unlimited amount of information, there is no limit to our curiosity. Or is there? Is our drive to learn and to grow and our capacity to achieve new heights only fueled by our curiosity? Or is there a limiting element in the equation? What supplies the oxygen that keeps the fire of inquisition burning? See, curiosity's flame can only stay alive to the extent that the tools we have can keep us curious and keep us finding the answers to our questions. The night sky has attracted more eyes, intrigued more people, and inspired more questions than any sight we've ever laid eyes upon. For thousands of years, we were left in the dark, unable to truly see all of the light given off by our universe. It wasn't until we were able to look up into the darkness and find these answers. From Earth, the unaided eye can see about two or 3,000 stars on a clear night. As Dr. Ford just explained, new telescopes and new advancements in technology allow us to see far across the universe, see stars across galaxies, and now we equate the number of stars in the universe to equal all the grains of sand on all the beaches on the Earth. The 3,000 or so stars we can see with the naked eye in the night sky would equate out to about a cubic centimeter of sand. So how did we go from just a few thousand stars to a number of stars that we cannot even fathom? How do we go from a cubic centimeter of sand to all the sand on all of Earth's beaches? It all started in the early 17th century with the advent of the telescope. In 1609, Galileo took a telescope similar to the one here, and he looked up into the moon. Now at this time, all sources of credible knowledge came from previous astronomers, earlier philosophers, and the Bible, all of which supported the geocentric model holding the center of the universe to be the Earth. Now the ruggedly surfaced Earth was supposed to be the center of the universe, the only celestial body with surface imperfections, whereas all the other planets and stars that we could see in the sky were perfectly round spheres with no surface imperfections. But as Galileo looked up into the, the sky and looked at the moon for a three-week period, he recorded his observations. He noted patches of darkness, shades of light, peppered across the surface of the moon. Until this time, the spots in the moon that we could see from Earth were explained to be caused by differences in how the sun reflected off of the perfectly fat, flat moon surface. But it really was a mystery of where did these spots come from, because this was a perfectly flat surface. Why was there differences in how the light was reflecting? But Galileo, in his three-week period of looking up into the moon, with a telescope that only enhances vision by 20 times, was able to see that these were craters on the moon. These peaks and valleys and mountains, similar to the ones found here, were what were causing the differences in shades of light, the darkness, the light. This groundbreaking discovery was the first to shake the foundations of the ge geocentric model. At this time, the Copernic Copernican model was proposed about half a century earlier, holding the sun at the center of the known universe. But the heliocentric model did not have much approval in the scientific community. It wasn't until Galileo used his tool of the telescope to look up and see the moon. In a more accurate perception, he was able to see that these craters on the moon disproved the fact that the Earth was the only celestial body with, perf with surface imperfections. Over the next century, the advancements of the telescope, the addition of mirrors, Astronomers were able to find more data points when they looked up into the sky and prove the heliocentric model to be true. So the curiosity was always there. 
The curiosity to look up into the stars and wonder why. For 10,000 years, we pretty much had the same knowledge base of what our universe was. We've learned more in the last four centuries about the, our universe than we did in those 10,000 years. Much, much more. Why? Our tools. Galileo wasn't the first person to look at the moon and be curious about the surface, but Galileo was the first person to have a tool that he was able to look at the moon and see it better himself. Now for a little more recent story. Uh, the other morning when I woke up, the first thing on my mind was my talk. As I climbed out of bed, I grabbed my glasses and put them on. I had a thought that the tools around us to find what we are looking for similar to my glasses, help us see the world around us more clearly. Walk to the bathroom and begin to wash off my face and brush my teeth, thinking, how did we really come to learn about all these stars and go from just being able to see two or 3,000 stars to knowing of all these stars across the universe? It was our tools. Our curiosity was always there, but it wasn't until we used these tools around us did we really find these answers. So I take off my glasses, place them on the counter. At this point, I'm legally blind in about seven states. I then take my contact to put in my contact lenses. As I go to put it in, it pops off my finger. Look around, patting. In a futile attempt to find my contact, I was unable to find it. I then realized, if a lens is what you're searching for, what lens do you use to find it? So with a chuckle, I grab my glasses, put them on, look around. Still, no contact. It's not on the ground, it's not on the counter, it's not in the sink. I couldn't find it. I then looked up in the mirror and realized the contact lens was stuck to my nose. <laughs> so maybe it takes a lens, maybe it takes a mirror, or maybe it takes a combination of the two. But it's not until you utilize the tools around you will you really find what you're looking for. And then you're going to realize it was right under your nose all along. Because the thing is, moving forward, we need to know what lenses, what mirrors, what lenses, what tools are available for us to find what we're looking for. Because it's going to take modern ideas and modern tools to make these modern discoveries. There's one thing you take away today. It would be a newfound importance for these tools that you have around you. All of us in here are curious. All of us in here want to learn. But will all of us in here use the tools around us to learn and to find the answers to the questions we have. And all of us in here have more tools at our disposal than any people before us. That is what gives us the capability to learn. All of us in here have the most powerful tool of all to find what we are looking for. And no, it's not the latest computer. It's not the fastest search engine. In fact, all of us have it in here right now. And no, it's not your smartphone. It's your brain. Our brain gives us the capability to answer any question we can come up with. Our brain gives us the capability to build the tools to find the answers to these questions. I challenge you to use the tools around you. Use the tools that are available to satisfy your curiosity. And I ask you, when you come across a time when the tools are not available to pursue your, curi to pursue your curiosity, Will you sit and wait, or will you go and quench your thirst? Because if you sit and just look up into the stars without a telescope, your curiosity will die of thirst. I ask you, if you come across a curiosity and there is no tool to help you satisfy your curiosity, what will you do? Will you be the one to build the tool Will you be the one to step up to the challenge? Will you be the one that develops that telescope to look beyond the stars and answer those questions of how, what, and why? I ask you, will you be the one to use the greatest tool of all? Thank you. <laughs>